Okay, so Advent. Uh, Advent is a time uh, of just preparation and leading up to Christmas where uh, we just build that anticipation for, for what is for what God has done in our world. So the four Sundays leading up to uh, Christmas, we do something a little different. Uh, we light a candle relating to the theme of the week, and uh, this week that theme is uh, joy. So at this time, I want to invite up Teresa Tang, so you guys can give her a little round of applause here. She comes on up. So... On the third Sunday of Advent, the rose-colored candle is lit. This candle represents joy, the same joy that the surprised shepherds experienced when they heard the good news announced by the angels. In some traditions, this candle is also called the shepherd's candle. There you go. Okay, good morning. Um, the first Advent reading for this week is from Isaiah 12, 2 to 6. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted, sing praise to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. And the second reading for this week is from 1 Peter 3 to 9. <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him, and rejoice with joy that it that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. All right, well, join with me this morning as we pray. God, thank you so much that uh, we can have joy simply because of you, uh, for uh, the way that you have met us as people. Uh, God, I'm just reminded this morning that so many of us come from uh, situations and stories that uh, may be filled with hardship or grief, God, uh, and just that uh, you meet us in that place, God, and that uh, even within those moments that you have this unexpressible joy for us, God. I just pray for everyone here in this room that uh, we would feel that joy this morning, that you know, even though we are uh, sometimes just so reserved in our, in our lives, God, that uh, we would be joyful in expressing uh, our thanks and just our, uh, yeah, our ability to see just how many wonderful things that you have done for us, God. Just pray this morning that that would seep through us. And pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Perfect. All right, give a big round of applause to Teresa. Thank you. Perfect. All right, and we have the privilege this morning. Uh, our pastor Kyle has been doing a little trade-off here with a couple of other pastors. Uh, so we get uh, a little bit of variety, a little spice in our Christmas time here. So uh, this morning we have the amazing opportunity to have uh, our pastor from Cochrane Alliance Church, Jason Koliba. I even pronounced it right, I believe. So uh, welcome him up here, and uh, we'll get going this morning.
All right, good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be with you at the dark side. Uh, I'm going to put in for Kyle to uh, change it. I'm sure you've heard lots of jokes uh, about, uh, about the decor here. My kids would love to be here at church this morning. Um, Kyle, I think, is uh, in Springbank at Westlife, and uh, Bryce from Westlife is uh, preaching in my pulpit today. Uh, so it's really cool. I've heard lots of stories uh, about Capstone Church because when we Alliance pastors get together, uh, Kyle has rock star status because of uh, what is going on here. Uh, and he always speaks so highly of uh, you as a community of people. Uh, and so it's great kind of to be with you on a Sunday, see some of your faces and hear a little bit of what's going on. Uh, I know that uh, when I talked to my wife last week about Kyle speaking at Cochrane, uh, I said, how did he do? And he's like, she was like, oh, Jason, it was awesome. It was like the best sermon I've heard in a long time. <laughs> he was like, he was like good stories and he was like moving. You need to learn some things from Kyle. So I hope uh, that uh, you don't feel you got too much of a downgrade with your own guy not being here this morning. Uh, seriously, though, I have had a chance to uh, engage a little bit with Kyle, and uh, one thing I notice about him is that he refers to Jesus more than any other person I know. Uh, the name Jesus gets dropped in like every fourth sentence, and uh, I know that uh, he loves you, but he loves uh, Jesus even more, and it's so fantastic to see this community of people that with him is seeking to promote uh, the name of Jesus in this neighborhood. Um, I'm gonna, you're gonna have to be patient with me. Like this is the first time I've preached in a long time with no warm up. So uh, how about we, uh, we try to get, uh, get rolling with just a few uh, interesting trivia bits. I am, a, I am a sucker for like top 10 lists on the internet. How many of you like get trolled into that stuff when you're on CNN and there's like a top 10? I'm one of those people. So we are uh, in this series about uh, gifts. And so I was looking at like some of the most expensive uh, e extravagant gifts that have ever been given. And I came across this story from 1917. A New York banker named Morton Plank wanted to give his wife an extravagant uh, gift. And uh, so he um, traded his Fifth Avenue mansion in New York City, which was valued at about a million dollars at that time. Today's value, $20 million then. And he decided to trade that house for a pearl necklace from Cartier, and he gave it to uh, his wife. So I hope she liked it, liked it because uh, just a few years after that, uh, something happened in Japan where we learned to make cultured pearls, which means you can make them way quicker, way faster, and that caused the pearl market in the world to collapse. So when she died, his wife, in 1956, they sold that same pearl necklace that he traded the house for, for $150,000. <laughs> that mansion now, which <clears throat> if you go to New York, that is the flagship Cartier store in New York, it would be worth hundreds of millions of dollars because of such prime real estate in like one of the hottest real estate markets on the planet. That is an expensive gift, and I don't know... If you can want coffee, that's great. I'll take a pearl necklace or a mansion. <laughs> uh, I was doing a little bit of research uh, to see, you know, if there were some extravagant gifts I could give my wife, and you can still waste your money on a lot of different things today. So uh, I was looking uh, in Bazaar magazine, and they were listing like some of the crazy gifts you can give. And Harrods in London is selling this Christmas 12 of the only 70 lunar meteorites that uh, we have or we know of on Earth. And uh, so you can uh, buy this meteorite uh, and give, if you have like your loved one wants the moon, you can literally give them a piece of the moon. And I was trying to find out, okay, how much would it be for a lunar meteorite? And uh, it's so expensive, you have to phone them for an appointment to talk about it. So I can only hazard a guess how much uh, it would be. And I hope that you get great gifts uh, this Christmas, coffee, of course, um, but we are exploring gifts that come to us from the best gift giver of all, and that's God himself. The book of James says that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down to us from the Father of the heavenly lights. 
And I know that uh, we believe that Jesus is the best gift of God ever, but there are so many others that come along with Jesus. And I want to unwrap in this last one of the series one of my favorite gifts, which is the gift of adoption or the gift of belonging in God's family. The book of Ephesians says that even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Every single human being on the planet can know God as their creator because God is their creator. He is the one who designed and made us all. But it is only through Jesus that men and women, students, boys and girls get adopted into God's family and can know God not just as their maker, but as their dad. And I wonder this morning as you're waking up, if you know God that way. Of all the biblical writers, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the one who most explores the idea of being adopted into God's family. And he does this uh, in a direct reference to Christmas in the book of Galatians chapter 4. And I know that not many people are preaching from the book of Galatians when they're in Advent time, but we're going to try. And if you have a Bible or a digital device can get you there, I want to invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 23. And uh, this is going to take a little work to get to, but I think it'll be worth it. So let's, let me read a little selection from what Paul is writing here to these people in the ancient province of Galatia. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Through faith in Jesus, you can be adopted into God's family and become one of God's kids. And I want to suggest to you that as good as like a meteorite might be, or a real estate in Manhattan or Pearls, this will change your life. It may not sound that way when you first read this Bible passage, so let's do a little exploration, and this is what I'd like to do this morning. I'd like to take, first of all, a few minutes to unpack what in the world Paul is talking about and answer the question, what does this mean? Because the Apostle Paul is making some technical arguments here that I think are a bit difficult to understand at first. 
And then, after we've tried to understand what Paul's talking about, I'd like to make three applications on why I think this makes a difference to people living in the 21st century like you and I. So here we go. What is all this talk about adoption and inheritance and being an heir? What does that really mean? So first of all, let me set the context. Because uh, what Paul is writing about, I almost promise you that none of you, when you woke up this morning thinking about coming to church, none of you were thinking about the reasons that Paul was writing this letter. He's making this Christmas point because of an argument that people in the churches of this province in Galatia were having. Most of the people that were in churches in those days in that province were Gentiles. That is, they had formerly uh, been worshipers of Greek or Roman gods. They came from different Gentile backgrounds. They were Roman, they were Greek, they were barbarian. And they had heard about the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. And they had decided as people to follow Jesus and probably to get baptized. Most of the people in the churches of that time were in that boat. But. There was a little minority in the church, people from a different ethnic background. They were Jewish. And the Jewish people had centuries of very specialized history. They were special because God has chosen them that way. They were descendants of Abraham. And they were the original recipients of the Ten Commandments and all the Mosaic law that you can find in the Torah. They were the family from which Jesus himself had come from. And some people from that little minority group in the churches were making an argument that if you really wanted to be a serious Christian, if you really wanted to follow Jesus, then not only should you put your faith in him, not only should you be a baptized, but you should also adopt a Jewish way of life. You should, if you wanted to please Jesus, observe the Jewish law, you should recognize Jewish holidays and culinary traditions, and you should get circumcised if you were a man. And the letter to Galatians, in which we just read a little part, and is written by Paul, who himself came from an uber-fundamentalist background. He is making an emotional, frustrated, angry, furious rebuttal against those Jewish people and a desperate plea to the Gentile Christians not to become Jewish Jesus followers, but just to be Jesus followers and stop. So that's the context. That's the argument that's going in the background. What is, what is Paul trying to tell them? We don't have time to read the whole book, so let's just summarize our first little section. Verse 23 and 24. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be fully justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Paul says, look, Jewish people who are honest with themselves know that strictly following the law of Moses is not all that it's cracked up to be. In fact, having to obey that stuff all the time is like being in jail. Your life is constricted and confined. Having to obey the law is like being a child in the custody of a really strict nanny or a harsh taskmaster who just is there to make you obey the rules and doesn't care one bit about you as a person. They just go around with a big stick all the time warning you about the punishments you will face if you disobey. And Paul says, who wants to be in prison under the supervision of a harsh taskmaster with a big stick. Nobody. It was never God's intention, said Paul, for people to be under those rules forever. His purpose for the prison and for the nanny was to create in people a desire for something better, something more. God's plan was to get people out of jail, to get rid of the nanny, and to become independent, free, inherited sons of God. All along, God wanted people to, 
to be free so that they could obey God not out of compulsion or obligation or out of fear of the consequences, but out of a heart that was naturally responsive to God's love. And now, Paul says, this is possible. Now that Jesus has come, people need no longer to be subject to the law because they can become children of God. And they can do that simply. Now, at least it was, it's simple for us, but it wasn't simple for God. People can be brought into God's family simply by putting their faith in, trusting in, being baptized into, identifying with Jesus. That's it. That's all that God requires of a person who wants to be a serious Christian. If you're in Jesus, then it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or a Greek, if you've got lots of money or if you're poor, your gender is of no concern. Jesus puts us all on equal footing. We're all God's kids, all part of Abraham's family. Now, a little note. I suspect that many of you in your Bibles and your translation may have this phrase, sons of God, that Paul keeps using over and over again. Why wouldn't he be uh, more gender neutral? The reason is, in Paul's day, again, we're talking 2,000 years ago now, in, in his day, daughters did not have all the full rights and privileges of the oldest son, even if they were the oldest daughter. Only in, in that day, sons got the full privileges and inheritance and independence that came along with being a, 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 of a majority age. And so when Paul is writing this letter, he's going with that nuance. He says, look, Everyone, regardless of their gender or class or race, gets maximum privilege in God's family as sons. Women, men, it's all the same. Your spiritual standing has nothing to do with those old categories. Everybody gets full privileges as quote-unquote sons. Does that make sense? I hope so because if you don't like it, we're just going to keep moving on. So, here's what he says. Everyone gets full privileges, doesn't matter. Verse 4 of chapter uh, 4. When the time had fully come, this is Christmas time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. God, Paul says, paid it an incredible price to rescue you Gentiles from prison and slavery. He knew in advance how complicated the adoption process would be that we would rebel against him, that it would take the sacrifice of his son to make the whole legal process possible. But God still went ahead with it, choosing Abraham's family, waiting centuries for the right time to come, sending Jesus to suffer, but it was worth it for him. We were worth it to him. It gave him great pleasure to include us in his family. Full rights, full privileges, full inheritance, the Holy Spirit in our hearts, the honor of calling God dad, an inheritance kept in heaven for us that no one can ever take away. So Paul says, if that's true, if anyone who puts their faith in Jesus receives full rights as inherited sons, Why would anyone want to go back to the old legalistic ways? Why would you want to get circumcised and have to obey the special traditions of the Jewish people or give up eating sausage and seafood? 
Do you want to go back to jail, Paul says? Why would any 25-year-old son invite the nanny back into his house to babysit him again? Being under the nanny means that someone else manages your estate and orders you around. But that's what you'll do, Paul says, if you buy into this fundamentalist garbage that the Jewish teachers are telling you. That's his argument to a bunch of people wrestling with a question that we don't really think about very much. Why does this matter to us in Southwest Calgary in 2018? Does it make a difference? Yeah, I think it does. And let me give you just three ways that I think it changes the ball game for us. Number one, <clears throat> In this family, the old distinctions that we use to give ourselves status, well, they are irrelevant. Gender, race, social class. When it comes to where you stand with God, if you are in Jesus, then those labels or identities don't matter one bit. It's not that we stop, and this is obvious, it's not that we stop being men and women. We still retain our gender. We all come from somewhere. In my church this morning, I know there are people of Ukrainian and Stony and Ugandan and Brazilian and Scottish descents there. When you turn to Jesus, it's not that you drop that part of yourself or stop speaking your language or forget your roots. It's just that God doesn't award you status or merit or position based on those distinctions. He doesn't look on you differently because you have more money or less of it. And the point for us is, neither should we. In fact, we betray our Father when we let those differences divide us. If God didn't care whether his adopted daughter grew up in India really poor, then why should you care? If God isn't sucking up to sons with wealth and privilege and really nice clothes, then why are we? And I don't think that the list in Galatians 3.28 is exhaustive either. There are other status symbols that are equally unimportant in God's economy. And we use these distinctions in church, maybe, maybe not a capstone, but I certainly have seen them in our church. Well, I've never committed that kind of sin which would make me better than her. I'm a conservative Christian. Well, I'm an open-minded liberal Christian. I'm Alliance. I'm Baptist. I'm Reformed. Well, I'm better than you all because I don't believe in denominations. <laughs> I've been a Christian for 25 years. I've done a lot of reading from the Bible. I have a theological education. I'm a professional. I have lots of leadership experience. Do you know who I am? Yeah, I know who you are. If you belong to Jesus, you are a part of Abraham's family. You are one of millions of men and women, boys and girls from every cultural, economic group imaginable. You're one of God's kids, a former slave of sin for whom Jesus died and brought into God's family amazing who you are. Good for you. Merry Christmas. But please, sit down, stop banging your chest, and take your seat beside the rest of your brothers and sisters. Are we with the Apostle Paul on this one? Cool. The old status symbols are irrelevant in God's family. 
The second reason our adoption makes a difference is that we get to experience God as dad. One more time, verse 6. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. For people who grew up in Paul's cultural context, one of the first words that you would hear any child begin to speak would be the words for their parents. Imma in Aramaic, mum. Abba, dad. Those are incredibly intimate terms that are usually reserved for children of the parents only. And I don't know, when you imagine what God is like, I don't know what kind of picture you have for God when you think about who the creator of the universe really is. Maybe you think of him as an absentee father or a disappointed authority figure, a distant old man, maybe a harsh judge or policeman. Maybe you think of God as your boss or your commander. The truth is, when you get adopted into God's family through Jesus, your heavenly Father becomes to you Dad. What's interesting is that Paul writes this whole letter of Galatians in Greek, which is the common language of the day. And that's what most of the people reading or hearing the letter would have understood. But when he gets to this verse, all of a sudden Paul switches language and, and pulls out this Aramaic term, Abba. Why use that word when the people that you are writing to don't speak that language? I think, and many others think, that it's probably because Paul and the other writers of the Bible were preserving a special language that pointed precisely at someone who dared to speak to God with that level of familiarity. Some of you may remember who that is, right? Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane? Who's talking here? Abba, Father, he said. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. No one else before or during Jesus' time would have dared to speak to God in such terms, calling him dad. But as a son, Jesus talked to and related to his father as, well, dad. My friends, when we get adopted into the family, we get to come and know the creator of the universe that same way. When your life hits the fan, you don't need to dig deeper into yourself like all the self-help books say. You get to come right into God's presence and cry out with Jesus, Abba, Dad, it's tough. Help. And I wonder if you know God that way. As your dad. And maybe this morning as we're getting really close to Christmas, the Holy Spirit is just saying, hey, head in closer to your father. Go sit on his knee. Get, get a hug. Get, get the embrace and the support that you're looking for. Let's move beyond religion as a series of do's and don'ts, a set of rules, and take your place around the table as a son, as a daughter. And when we celebrate communion, it really is a family meal for sons and daughters around the father's table. One more reason the gift of adoption makes a difference for us. And that is this. We are free 
from the prison of legalism and rules. And I don't know uh, where you come from in your religious upbringing or if you've got no religious upbringing, but this is particularly for those of you who came from a strict religious background. For many Christians, the temptation to play by a strict guidebook of rules, regulations, and in and out behavior, well, that temptation is very strong for us. If you are a Christian, you do this and this and this, and you do not do that and that and that. Religion is about black and white. Just give us the rules, preacher, and we will follow them. If that's what's most attractive to you about Christianity, then you probably don't need Jesus. Paul writes in Galatians 5, just a little bit after our passage, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. If Jesus had to die to free people from legalism 2,000 years ago, why would we want to go back to the nanny with the big stick? We're heirs now. Now, don't get me wrong, there are standards of conduct in Christianity. We are called to, fancy theological word, holiness. God intends to make us more holy. The Holy Spirit has been given to us so that our characters and our desires and our behaviors can be shaped to be like the character and behavior and desires of Jesus. But we no longer have to muster up the momentum from within ourselves to be good enough for God. For us, Jesus is good enough. He has become, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, our righteousness. He is good enough for us. God has known since before you were born that you would never be good enough. You would never pray enough. You would rarely live up to the standards that you demand of others, that you would regularly disappoint yourself and other people. And so he says to you and to me, Jason, relax. Stop trying to impress me with your great spiritual skills. Stop trying to earn my love through an impressiveness of your own. You are a son because of my son, Jesus. Grab onto him. He's good enough. I think it's kind of like playing Texas scramble golf. Are there any golfers out in the crowd this morning? A few. Uh, if you don't know how Texas Scramble works, let me, uh, let me explain kind of how it goes. Generally, it's a team of four people, and instead of like having to follow your own ball around, you get to, everybody takes a shot, and then you go and take your next shot from where the best player's ball lands. And that way, uh, when you play, you end up doing a lot better. Usually, at least one of you has a good shot, and you end up having scores that make it seem like you're a PGA player. A few years ago, uh, I got invited to play at uh, an invitational golf tournament just west of here at Elbow Springs course. And you need to know that I am a terrible golfer. Uh, maybe once a year I get out on the course. But the other three people I was golfing with, they were like regular golfers. And so at the first tee box, everyone took a hit and their best shot. And I was like wanting to impress these guys. I worked with them and I just like wound up as hard as I could. And it went way off to the left. The next hole, it was way off to the right. It was going into the sand. And these other guys were making phenomenal shots, great drives, great chips. And after like three or four, four holes, I'm like, you know what? I don't need to try so hard to impress these guys. If I hit it into the water, no sweat. I can just like go take my next shot from one of theirs. And 
after the first nine holes, we got off the green and we were three under. Tiger Woods has scores sometimes that are three under. And I started to relax a little more and it wasn't such a big deal if I hit it well or bad. And lo and behold, I made a few drives that were usable and uh, we scored an eagle as a team and we came to the clubhouse with this great store and the other teams were asking me, you know, Jason, how's your game? How's it going for you today? And I said to them, well, to be honest, not so good. But Brent and Tim and Gord, they are doing great for me. And by the end of the last, uh, by the last hole, we won the tournament and I got to spend 150 bucks at the clubhouse and I got my very own golf shoes, which makes me look more like a pro, even though I can't play that way. And I kind of think that's like the life of freedom that God wants you and I to live. Best ball golfing with Jesus. And I imagine Jesus inviting me to say, Jason, do you want to go golfing with me? And I tell him, well, yeah, I'd love to hang out with you, but you know, Jesus, I'm not much of a golfer. I, I kind of suck. And he says, no problem. Come anyways. It's going to be great. And so we get up to the first tee and Jesus invites me to take a sh the first shot and I wind up and I give it my best. And it is a perfectly straight shot down the middle of the fairway, 35 yards out. And I turn around and I say to Jesus, remember what I said, not very impressive. And he says, no problem. He steps up there, tees it off, whacks it 380 yards, right onto the edge of the green. And I say, Jesus, wow, that's amazing. You've been on this course before. And he says, yeah, maybe a little. In the next hole, he goes first, and it's a par three, and he whacks it within three feet of the cup. And I think to myself, well, what do I have to lose? And I wind up, and I plunk it on the green only 16 feet away. And Jesus says, great shot, Jason, way to go. And I go putt in his shot for a birdie. It goes on like that until the seventh hole when he hits another beauty straight down the fairway. And I say, Jesus, you are on fire today. And I wind it up and it hooks way into the trees. And I think to myself, oh man, I knew this is gonna happen. And I start to march off into the woods. And Jesus says, Jason, where are you going? Well, Jesus, I let you down again. My prayer life is embarrassing and I'm, I'm not doing enough to serve other people. I, I want it to be more holy. I, I should have tried harder to follow the rules. I've gotta go find my ball now. And he says, why would you do that? Hunting for balls is just discouraging. Can't you see that I've got this one covered for you? Come on, let's go, let's golf. And I know at the end of the day, at the end of my life, we will get back to the clubhouse and someone will ask me, Jason, how did you do at following Jesus? How hard did you work? Did you check all the boxes? Did you follow the rules? How have you measured up? How did you do? And I will say, well, I wasn't so impressive. But Jesus, he did really well for me. I am free from the prison of legalism and rules. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. I want to pray for you guys, and I know that we're headed into a time of worship and a time around the communion table. I don't know what business the Father might want to do with you in that time, but I want to suggest that you maybe wrestle with a little bit in the next few minutes that we've got together with how you know your dad. And if you only know him as a drill sergeant, maybe it's time to, uh, to drop that image and ask him for some help that you might know him as 
dad. And if you've been trying really hard lately to impress God, maybe it's time to stop being so impressive yourself and uh, maybe ask Jesus how you might receive his impressiveness on you so that you can relax, that you can enjoy the Christian life as it was meant to be lived. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Dad, how dare I speak to you that way, that familiarly. But on the basis of what Jesus has done for us as uh, his kids, Father, I know I can relate to you that way. And so can the men and women that are gathered with me this morning. I pray, Father, that uh, we might know the benefits of belonging to your family. For someone who doesn't know you as dad this morning, I, I pray that because your Holy Spirit is here, they would sense that invitation to know you, not just as some guy far away in the sky, maybe who you know, got the world rolling but then left it, but they might know you as someone who is intimately concerned and deeply in love with us. And uh, if you're putting out that invitation, Father, I pray that we might be able to hear it. I pray for the way uh, this family of people relates to one another. And Father, if there are barriers that are dividing people from just being equals, from being your kids around the table, I pray you'd break those down. And lastly, God, if we are seeking to live by our own righteousness, by pleasing you, by obeying rules and being the right kind of person, I pray that you would release us from that kind of slavery to law and rules. And instead, we might receive the gift of Jesus' impressiveness on our behalf. Would you make it so in our lives? I pray this in his name. Amen.